Okay, so um, last week we started off, we basically went through how we could improve, start to improve sensitivity and resolution. Um, and so we discussed a little bit about how we can make oriented samples and how by orienting these anisotropic interactions that we have in the solid state, we can get resolution back in biological solid state NMR uh, experiments. And we also went through uh, basically how many chemical spinning can be used to average out these anisotropic interactions. So we've discussed to a certain degree a little bit about how we can improve the resolution. And we've also seen that basically also by improving the resolution, we also improve sensitivity. Because now instead of having all our intensity distributed throughout these, um, uh, these entire profiles, they're now focused into relatively sharp resonances. So in those, in those respects, magic chemical spinning and the preparation of oriented samples improves resolution and sensitivity at the same time. Now, the other way we can sit there and think about improving sensitivity is very similar to the way that the, the liquid state NMR people uh, view it. And that's by basically trying to transfer magnetization from very abundant spins with high gyro magnetic ratios to low gamma um, uh, nuclei. So the first thing we should think about is what we actually want to detect in, in biological solid state NMR. Now, if people um, come to this discipline from the liquid state, what they expect is we should always observe things like protons. Now, the thing is, we have a problem when we want to try and observe protons in the, uh, in the solid state. So if you look here on the left, uh, what we have is basically a spectrum in the liquid state of a small protein called BPTI. And then what we've done is basically scaled it, so we've put it on the same uh, scale here as a proton spectrum of rhodopsin, which is a nice sort of 60, 70 kilodalton integral membrane protein. And as you can see, what we have, we've gone from this nice, well-resolved spectrum here to this rather broad, relatively featureless, not in the middle of our spectrum. So the question is, is why does that occur? Well, the reason this occurs is because in the solid state, we have these strong homonuclear dipole couplings between the abundant protons and the sample. Now, as we mentioned last week, we can have homogeneous and inhomogeneous interactions. In the case of the proton dipole couplings, these are so-called homogeneous interactions. So that means that sort of more moderate spin speeds it's not very easy to average out these proton-proton dipolar couplings. Now, methods have been developed for trying to do this uh, through using clever pool sequences to suppress these uh, homonuclear, uh, proton homonuclear dipolar couplings. Typically, though, if you want to use those in di uh, during direct observation, they're challenging to implement. They can lead to artifacts, and you end up scaling some of the other interactions you may be interested in um, in any case. So, uh, as a result, what we typically do is try and exploit low gamma nuclei. So why do we want to exploit low gamma nuclei? Well, these low gamma nuclei, typically, uh, they have a lower gyromagnetic ratio, so the coupling's not quite so strong. So, for example, if you take adjacent uh, carbon atoms, what you'll find is they have couplings in the region of 2.5 kilohertz, which we can start to suppress, even in the homogeneous sense, by spinning at uh, tens of kilohertz. Uh, secondly, these spins usually are a little bit more sparse than the protons in the sample, and therefore these networks aren't quite as interactive. So, what are the advantages of detecting low gamma nuclei? I apologize for all the Greek symbols. Math type wrote it all. Uh, so, if you um, look at low gamma nuclei, what you find is that they're not always high in natural abundance. So, if you take things like carbon, you've got uh, abundances of about 1%. If you're looking at nitrogen, you can start to go even lower. So typically, when we're doing biomolecular NMR, one of the first problems we have to overcome is how we're going to enrich our sample with the isotope that we're interested in. So when we're talking about protein species, typically this, what this means is we need to come up with a system whereby we can express it in some organism which is amenable to isotope labeling. And so financially, the, usually this means that we want to start heading towards expressing our protein of interest in bacteria. Um, now the other downside is, is that if it has a low gyromagnetic ratio, it also means it's going to uh, give us far less signal than our, than our protons with our, their high gyromagnetic ratio. Now the liquid state people overcame this by developing techniques such as inept. So are people familiar with inept? Yeah, okay. So this is the, the pulse sequence from uh, inept. So quick quiz, what format does the inept, what format does the signal take at the end of this uh, sequence here? What format does the signal take? Everyone said they were familiar with it. What, what form? 
formed as a signal take. Ah, so it's like, yeah, okay, well done, Lydia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, so we have this anti-phase doublet. Now, in the liquid state, in liquid state NMR, where our J couplings are relatively large compared to our line width, what this means is we have our anti-phase doublet and we can still work with it. Now, in the case of solid samples, what we have is basically a lot of inhomogeneous broadening. And what this inhomogeneous broadening means is that if we start to have these antiphase doublers, at least if we take the, uh, the simple case of this uh, type of dynamic sequence we see here, what we get is basically these two broad resonances overlap with one another and the signals start to cancel out. So we actually don't do ourselves a lot of uh, good by trying to do these type of inept traffic splits. Now that doesn't mean these things don't work. Uh, people are using them quite widely now. Um, if in the context of using things like refocused inept experiments, so basically where both of these signals here have a positive intensity. Um, and they're also quite valuable if you have more mobile parts in uh, biomolecular solids. So you can use these inept type sequences, but as a whole, they not, tend not to be so useful in the solid state. Now, if you sit there and go back and think about these Hamiltonians we discussed last week, if we think about the J coupling, these are typically in the order of tens of to hundreds of hertz. So it's a relatively small interaction. It's certainly very small when we compare it to things like the dipole couplings between protons and carbons. So in the solid state, maybe it doesn't make quite so much sense to sit there and use these J-couplings to move polarization and magnetization between different sites in the molecule. So what people use instead is a technique called cross-polarization. So what we're going to do with cross-polarization is we're going to exploit the, uh, the dipole couplings uh, between the protons and the low gamma nuclei and both the abundance and the high gyromagnetic ratio of the protons. So this is the full sequence, and it's, basically, it's the basic building block of pretty much most of the biomolecular and solid state NMR experiments that you can actually conduct. So just in terms of an outline of what's happening, what are we doing? So, uh, okay, so first of all, we do a 90 degree pulse on our protons, and we spin lock it with uh, a strong uh, V1 field on the protons. So at this point, basically, we, sp we spin lock our proton magnetization along a particular axis. At the same time, we spin lock our uh, low gamma nucleus um, along the same axis. So why does this transfer of magnetization occur between the protons and the carbon? Now, there's many, many explanations for how this works. We can have a quantum mechanical description, so we have a co coherent description of transfer of magnetization between the two spins. People have described thermodynamic treatments about why uh, the magnetization moves from the uh, high temperature proton bath to the low temperature uh, low gamma bath by this dipole coupling. But I find what one of the most easiest, or one of the easiest concepts you can come up with is one that was uh, given in a book by uh, Charles Schlichter. And so if we think about what's happening during these uh, spin lock periods, what we're actually getting is the magnetization to be locked at a particular axis. Uh, locked in a particular axis um, with a particular field strength. So we apply this, these uh, RF fields to both the I and the S fields. And so what we're essentially doing is locking these things against the same axis here. Now, what this is essentially doing is instead of the, the uh, spins being quantized in the main magnetic field, they're now quantized in the B1 field. Now, if we quantize them such that basically these spins are locked with the same uh, RF field strength, what this means is the energy level is the same. Now, if the energy levels are the same, then we are in a position whereby we can exchange magnetization between the two, uh, two spins. The only thing we need is a mechanism for coupling these two spins. And in the case of cross-polarization, at least typically in the solid state, uh, this coupling is mediated by the uh, heteronuclear dipolar coupling between the um, I, um, protons or the low gamma nuclei. And so what we can do is we can get resonant energy transfer then between the I and the S. So there are far more detailed descriptions, uh, but I think just conceptually it's quite easy to sit there and think about it. You basically quantize in the V1 field. Once you quantize this ma uh, ma the magnetization of the V1 field, the energy levels are the same. We couple these two uh, systems by the dipolar coupling, and we can get the exchange of magnetization between the two sides. Because I want Z and I to do this for exit. For scheme I and X? Uh, yes. Yeah, sorry, there's a, yeah. So yes, it should be um, IZS. So experimentally, what is observed? So, what is observed? If we sit there and look at, um, and we plot out the difference between these two different field strengths, 
as a function of the uh, coupling between the two. What we find is that when these two field strengths are matched, we see a transfer of magnetization between the I spin and the S spin. And what we find is that the mat this uh, condition here is reliant on basically getting these two RF field strengths the same. And the width of this um, matching condition is given by the strength of the coupling between the protons and the low gamma nuclei. And we'll come back to this a little bit later on. Okay, so experimentally, if this is our matching condition, so what we've done at this point, sorry, is basically made it so that these two spins are locked at the same RF field strength. And we do this experimentally by sweeping one of the uh, RF fields here uh, against one of the other RF fields. Now, if we take a nice spin system, such as those that you can create inside a computer, uh, where you basically have two spins, I and S, which are coupled by a single dipolar coupling, what you find is that basically what you'll observe is a coherent transfer of magnetization between the two sides. And you'll get these type of um, oscillations that you see here. And these oscillations here basically um, are a function of the strength of the dipolar coupling. So in principle, we can use this as a measure of the dipolar coupling between the two sides. And I'll come back to that in a moment. If you do these types of experiments, what you find is that your maximum efficiency for these types of experiments typically is in the region of about 72%. And the reason for that is because you have this distribution of um, molecules in your powder sample, and so not all of them are recoupled with the same efficiency. So you're looking at a maximum efficiency of about 72%. Now, so that, that's great. If we take our nice um, static sample, we can do cross-polarization. We can get transfer from these protons to these low gamma nuclei. Now, Last week we discussed magic angle spinning, and we discussed it in the context of, okay, we can, measure, we can um, average out these inhomogeneous interactions relatively easily. So the heteronuclear dipole coupling, typically it's a um, uh, heterogeneous interaction. So a magic angle spinning, a higher spinning speed should actually start to suppress it. So for a long time people thought, okay, well we won't bother trying to do cross-polarization under magic angle spinning. But um, what's Schaefer? Uh, so this did, uh, did was basically just try the experiment in any case. And what they find is that when you do this experiment, instead of just having this single matching condition that we saw under the static case, under magic angle spinning, we now have this matching condition here where the two RF fields strengths are the same, but now the matching conditions are spaced at the intervals of the side bands. Uh, sorry, at the intervals of the spinning speed. So we have one to the plus one and the plus two. Um, um, multiples of the spinning speed in either direction from the isotropic line. So what this means is that if we want to do cross-polarization of the magic angle spinning, we need to hit one of these resonance conditions. What you typically find as well is that these matching conditions are now typically a lot narrower than they are for the static case. Okay, so now we have cross-polarization. We found that we can combine it with magic angle spinning. That's great. So we can now transfer polarization from our abundant protons to our low gamma nuclei. So what are the what are the headaches associated with this technique? So, one of the first issues we have is we have to think about the dynamics which are occurring within the sample. So if you think both about most biomolecular samples, then you can't really vi uh, view them as, as rigid systems. So you do have motions which are going on. Now, I told you a moment ago that basically the, the, rate of uh, the rate of transfer of magnetization from the proton to the low gamma nucleus is dependent on the strength of the dipolar coupling between the two sides. So anything that starts to scale that dipolar coupling is going to have an impact on the rate at which that magnetization is transferred. And so here what you see is that I basically, okay, let's do that moment. Now in addition to that, what we have to think about is the rate at which the magnetization decays when we spin lock it from these RF fields. And so we, we have this process with Basically, it's a T1 row, so it's a relaxation in the rotating frame. And as this relaxation in the rotating frame um, causes the, the proton spin lock magnetization to decay, what you find is it will also suppress your signal. So, typically, when you do these experiments, what you do is optimize the length of the contact pulse between the protons and the low gamma nuclei. And what you find is that depending on the strength of your dipolar coupling, and the rate of your T1 row relaxation, so your relaxation in the rotating frame, is that you can significantly enhance or attenuate the, uh, the efficiency of this technique dependent upon how fast the system's relaxing. So you see here we have uh, examples of increasing T1 row, 
And here basically what I've done is basically model these with different strengths of dipolar couplings. Now, we can actually use this uh, to start to understand the dynamics which are present in biological systems. So you can basically model this transfer process as uh, the sum of other, these two exponential processes that we see here, and you get the following types of curves out. And in each case, what we do, certainly when we're looking at biological samples, is basically try and identify this often. And frequently what people do is use these types of curves to characterize the motions which are present in the system. It's like a poor man's T1 row experiment. Okay. So you get information about what's happening with the dipole coupling and the rotating triangulation. What's interesting about this is if you look at the strength of the dipole couplings here, these tend to be uh, sensitive to motions which are occurring on the, uh, the microsecond time scale, whereas the T1 row processes, which are sequentially your signal towards the end of these curves, tend to be dependent on motions on the millisecond time scale. So you have a very quick readout as to the density of motions on the microsecond and the millisecond time scale, just by optimizing one of the equal strengths. So, uh, advantages of cross-polarization. Um, typically, we can see theoretical enhancements of the ratio to two gyromagnetic ratios. So, in the case of nitrogen, we should be looking for enhancements of about a factor of 10, uh, and carbon-13, typically a factor of 4. These are theoretical enhancements, not reality. Reality, maybe not. Um, the other advantage we have by doing cross-polarization is that um, uh, magnetization is now derived from the protons. Now typically the protons in our samples decay, uh, relax a lot faster than the low gamma nuclei. What this means in terms of uh, sensitivity is that we can actually then repeat the experiment a lot more rapidly and therefore we can signal average a lot more frequently and so this can also have an impact on the types of uh, signal enhancement that we can get through the use of cross-polarization. So, what are the um, experimental difficulties of applying cross-polarization. So, the first one I mentioned, uh, we have to fulfill this so-called harm and harm condition. So in both the static and the magic angle spinning case, the width of this cross-polarization condition, is very, sorry, this harm and harm condition, is dependent on the strength of this dipolar coupling. So what this means is if we're looking at weak dipolar couplings, or couplings where we have a lot of, um, or systems where we have a lot of emotional averaging, these matching conditions can be very, very fine and that can cause some headaches when we're trying to do experiments. Um, because basically we then need to sit there and ensure that we, uh, we have the stability in our spectrometer such that we can maintain these harm and harm matches for the duration of the experiment. And if you think about it, if this harm and harm match is very, very narrow, and we have small fluctuations in amplifier output, what we're going to do is see huge changes in terms of signal intensity if we're on the edge of these uh, matching conditions. What that means in terms of doing two-dimensional experiments and things like this is that you're going to introduce a lot of noise into your system. Um, so I just like them here. It also causes issues in terms of like the distribution of uh, the radio frequencies within the coil. If you think about it, when we um, when we perform our experiments, we always assume that we have a mutation frequency. In reality, though, the mutation frequency isn't homogeneous across the width of the, the entire length of the coil. So what this means is that if the if the protons in the low gamma aren't excited similarly across the entire sample volume, what you'll find is you'll only have a very, very narrow pocket in your sample where you're actually getting efficient transfer of magnetization from the protons to the low gamma nuclei. So all of these things are important. So you basically need to ensure that you have very, very stable amplifiers, uh, and you also need to ensure that you have uh, probes with, with excellent B1 homogeneity. And if you have these two conditions fulfilled, what you typically get is basically very reliable um, spectrometer, which is good for doing by and for MR. Now, so these are some of the headaches. Um, people have tried to overcome them in other ways. Um, one, of, one of the first um, experiments that came out of uh, Stephen Smith's group in Yale uh, was basically the application of a ramped um, spin lock field on the proton uh, channel. But what this does is essentially it blurs out many of the um, any variations that we have in amplifier output and any variations we have in B1 field due to the geometry of the coil and the sample. So this was, by, this was you know, one of the first examples. At about a similar time, uh, groups in, uh, in Zurich were developing uh, so called adiabatic methods for performing cross-polarization. So these adiabatic methods, um, in principle, we have far higher theoretical transfers of magnetization 
So theory tells us we can transfer 100% of the magnetization from protons to our low gamma nuclei. And so this is implemented in a very similar way. What you essentially do is do a tangential sweep through the Hartman Hahn condition um, on your proton channel here. And so in principle, you should be able to get what's that 72% threshold. Um, these are just two that are probably what most widely used. There's a whole host of other um, schemes which are meant to suppress many of these um, instabilities. So you can think about things like phase modulation of the spin lock field, etc., etc. All of these essentially designed to do the same thing, which is minimize the sensitivity to variations in amplitude of the spin lock field and distributions of V1 field in the coil. So, um, we've basically um, viewed cross polarization in terms of things like signal enhancement. So, just as a, a routine building block in a biomolecular solids experiment, just to enhance our signal. But what I've also flanked up is that by looking at the, uh, the build up profile of your magnetization when you do these uh, cross polarization experiments, we can gain access to basically uh, a time constant which characterizes the strength of the dipolar coupling between protons and low gamma nucleus and the T1 row relaxation. But we have two other examples where we can actually use this. Uh, we can actually make use of it as a motional filter and we can actually use it to uh, characterize order parameters. So if we think about this in terms of um, as a motional filter, this is again some work we did many, many years ago on a small molecule called acetylcholine. What we're interested in is trying to understand how acetylcholine binds to this uh, 280 kilovolt and integral membrane protein. So what we did is we purified this 280 kilovolt protein and we added an excess of acetylcholine which has been labeled. So in this case it's been labeled in this quaternary ammonium group here. And so this is what you get from direct excitation of your sample. So what you see is this huge signal here which comes from this quaternary ammonium group which has been carbon 13 labeled. Now, if we do cross polarization on this small molecule in solution, what we typically find is it's tumbling too rapidly, the dipolar coupling is going to be average, and so the direct observation will see a signal when we do cross polarization, the dipolar coupling is um, average to zero, we have no contact now between the protons and the carbons, and therefore we'll end up in our isotropic case with no signal. Now, we can take another situation though. If our small molecule here, in this case acetylcholine, binds to our 280 kilovolt of protein embedded in this huge cell membrane, what we find is it becomes immobile. When it becomes immobile, the dipolar couplings are no longer zero. So they could theoretically head up towards 20 kilohertz in size. And so now when we do our cross polarization, if we do it without the ligand to start off with, we get this envelope here, which basically signals from the protein, the natural abundance of carbon atoms in the protein. And then we get this small resonance here appearing from these quaternary ammonium groups which is made with carbon-13. And so what we were able to demonstrate is that basically the moment this ligand gets emotionally restrained on the surface of this protein, we can use cross-polarization to selectively observe it. Okay? And you can demonstrate the fact that that's pharmacologically relevant binding um, through the application of inhibitors and things which basically will then suppress the signal. Okay? So you can use it as a very, very simple emotional filter. Uh, you can select the molecules which are binding to large receptors this is interesting, things like uh, screening of drugs, etc. Now, the other thing you can think about is looking at it in terms of uh, the co coherent build of um, the coherent transfer of magnetization from proton to carbon. So, right at the start, I showed you these nice um, um, transfer curves where we have these oscillations. I had mentioned that these oscillations are actually sensitive, um, are a reflection of the strength of the dipole coupling between the protons and the carbons. So there's some really excellent work which came out of Anne McDermott's lab, where basically she's made use of these oscillations here. And you basically, if you think about it, you can do a Fourier transform of this oscillation here. What you'll end up with is a nice sort of Peg style doublet here. And this Peg doublet basically gives you the strength of the dipole coupling between the proton and in this case the adjacent carbon atom. And so they were able to implement this in some form of two-dimensional experiment, and they can come up with these sort of peg patterns for each site in the protein. And in doing this, what they can do uh, is basically determine an order parameter for different sites throughout the protein. Why do we care for these order parameters uh, throughout the entire length of the protein? It starts to give us information about how these proteins are functioning. So if we have part of the protein where we're having large conformational changes occurring, 
on this micro or millisecond timescale, what we'll see is that these profiles change. These um, pay patterns that we're seeing here are going to change, and we can use this uh, then to start to understand some of the underlying biology as to how these proteins function and assign you know, motion to, to particular regions of the protein. So, okay, last point here. Um, mentioned before, when we're doing these experiments, typically what we see are these nice, um, also are these small, rather smooth build-up curves, and not these oscillations. So what people have done to try and get these uh, nice, um, sort of nice coherent build-up is basically two options. You can spin faster. So in, by doing so, what you're essentially doing is suppressing many of these proton-proton interactions to a large extent, so that the behavior becomes more oscillatory. The other way you can do it is by basically applying what we call the Goldberg decoupling to the proton channel, or you can transfer. I'll come back to this later. But basically, again, it's a technique which enables us to suppress the couplings between the protons. And at that point, these oscillations, instead of being the coupling of a low gamma nuclei to a bath of protons, becomes the coupling between the low gamma nuclei and the, the adjacent proton. And so it becomes coherent in nature. We get these nice patterns for Well, like I say, I'll come back to that later on as well. So, um, at this point, where are we? So I said last week, our goal was to move from these rather broad distributions that we see here. What we want to do is regain resolution, we want to gain, regain sensitivity. So I think that's what we've done here. I should point out that these cross-polarization techniques can be applied equally well under magic angle spinning and so can to orient samples. They work in both cases. So the next question is, is okay, we now have these well-resolved spectra. We have all these sides. All we need to do now is work out which sites are next, but close in close proximity to one another. Why do we need to know this? We need to know this because we need to identify which e what each of these peaks are. So if we take a, an average protein, we'll perhaps find thousands and thousands of carbon atoms in there. And so we need to work out what each what each peak represents. And then once we've done that, we also then need to start to be able to work for try and identify some of these longer range geometries so that we can start to fold our protein back into some form of structure so that we can start to understand what's going on in the system. So this is, a, this is a major headache. So we've applied magic angle spinning in this case. And what we've done is suppressed all these anisotropic interactions, which, are giving, uh, which gives us really great resolution. But we've now lost all the interactions which are giving us a lot of structural information. So what we need to think about now is how we can basically re reintroduce these interactions whilst retaining the resolution. Now, in terms of um, biological solid state NMR, by far the most um, important technique that people have been using or had to think about was basically how we can reintroduce these dipolar couplings. Why do we care so much about dipolar couplings? Dipolar couplings are important because they give us a, a, a direct measure of distances between atoms. If we have enough of these distances, we can sit there, we can go away to the computer and we can start to refold the protein structures. So, what we need to come up with is mechanisms for basically recoupling um, um, either you know, carbons to nitrogens or carbons to carbons. Uh, ideally, we'd like to be able to implement this in a nice two-dimensional experiment so that we can get these nice correlation maps that I've been showing you um, on these slides. So, uh, methods for transfer of polarization in their application. So, uh, what we want to do is basically be able to transfer uh, magnetization polarization from one site to another. So what we need to do is basically start to understand how we can manipulate these intera interactions um, so that we can gain this, uh, resolution and sensitivity. So that's what we've done with magic angles spinning and cross-polarization. Um, what we want to be able to do now is basically selectively reintroduce these anisotropic interactions at some point in the full sequence. So what we'd like to be able to do is perhaps have two, two time domains in our experiment where we're going to have nice raw resolved spectra, but at some point in the full sequence, enable these anisotropic interactions to drive the transfer of magnetization between different sites of that protein. And so basically what people have done is developed a whole family of different recoupling experiments. And so I've already shown you one example, one example will be cross polarization. So uh, this is what slide up here. So we have cross polarization, but there were also perhaps some uh, well, appeared about the same time techniques such as redor, which also enables to transfer magnetization between different low gamma nuclei. We also need methods for transferring uh, magnetization between different sites of the same spectrum, so from carbon-13 to carbon-13, M15 to M15. 
And people have come up with a whole range of methods, some of which are selective, things like rotational resonance, some of which are more broadband, things like spin diffusion, as you say. So what I'm going to do, uh, the last part of the talk, is basically run you through some of these. And it's not meant to be a comprehensive overview of every method that's out there. It's just me, there are many. What I've tried to do is focus in on those which have been widely exploited uh, to do biomimic and solid state technology. So, um, we don't need to go through this uh, too slowly. But um, again, we have this concept of doing cross polarization, as we discussed before. So, we basically spin lock our two, um, two nuclei uh, with the same um, RF field. When we do this, we get transfer of magnetization from our, uh, between two, two different spins. And this is mediated by uh, this dipole coupling that we have here. Now, I explained this before in the concept of transferring magnetization from the abundant protons to the low gamma nuclei. There's nothing stopping us applying this to, for example, carbon 13 and nitrogen 15. The only thing that makes this slightly challenging is the fact that, as I mentioned before, the width of these matching conditions is highly dependent upon uh, the strength of the dipolar coupling. Now, if you take a proton to carbon 13, what you find is the dipolar coupling is actually tens of tens of kilohertz. If you take the example of the nitrogen 15 to carbon 13, you're talking hundreds of times. So all of a sudden, these matching conditions become very, very narrow. So again, this places a lot of pressure on um, uh, basically the instrumentation where we want to get these transfers to work efficiently and reliably. Now, the other issue we have is the fact that the dipolar couplings are weaker. So as the dipolar couplings are weaker, the transfer of magnetization is going to occur over a lot longer time frame. So this leads to problems in terms of things like T1 rho relaxation. So if we have any motion in the system, it's occurring on a millisecond time scale, what we find is that basically the relaxation is occurring on a faster time scale than a buildup of, uh, sorry, faster than the transfer of magnetization between these two low gamma nuclei. And this can be, um, uh, particularly challenging by, by molecular samples where these millisecond motions are, uh, really have a, a very high density. And we'll come back to how we're going to be able to solve this in a moment. But in terms of um, basically transferring between nitrogen and carbon, this is pretty much the method which is, uh, which is very, very widely used. And the reason uh, it's been widely used is because we can start to incorporate it, incorporate it into experiments such as the ones we see here. So this is an example of what we call an NCA experiment, where what we've done is we've taken a um, protein, and we have our amino acids, here, and so what we've done is we've transferred our magnetization from the proton to the nitrogen, and now what we've done is transferred our magnetization from the nitrogen to this, what we call the C-alpha, or the C-A, and we've done that using two cross-polarization steps. Okay, and so you can envisage that we can actually code this up into a nice two-dimensional experiment, and I'll go through this in more detail in the next lecture. So we transfer our magnetization from proton to nitrogen. We then evolve our nitrogen chemical shift, and we do our second cross-polarization from carbon, sorry, from nitrogen to carbon 13, and now we evolve our carbon chemical shift. We have two time domains, T1 and T2, that are correlated with one another. So each peak in this spectrum represents one nitrogen atom sat next to one C alpha carbon. And so in, basically, in this spectrum here, so this is microcrystalline ubiquitin, so again, it's a small microcrystalline protein. What you can see is one nitrogen, one C alpha pairing for each uh, amino acid in this um, protein. So you take the carbon nitrogen? Yeah, not the carbon nitrogen. Yeah. What is that? Sorry? Which one do we detect? It's the nitrogen. No, we detect, we detect the carbon here. Okay. So what we've done is basically we've transferred to the nitrogen. We evolve our nitrogen uh, chemical shift. Yeah. Then we transfer from nitrogen to carbon, to carbon. and we evolve our carbon chemical shift. And so what this means is that each peak in the spectrum now represents one of these nitrogen carbon C alpha pairs uh, in the protein. And so there should in principle be one for each amino acid in the protein, if you're looking. Okay? So in many ways, this spectrum here, as you will see in your later lectures, represents sort of a fingerprint of the entire protein. So it's equivalent to what people do. We sort of view the HSQC as in the liquid state. So nice 
simple experiment. The nice thing is, if you take these sort of microcrystalline samples, typically you can measure these type of spectra in 10 or 15 minutes on as little as 4 or 5 milligrams of protein. That's right, yeah. If we could, yeah. Okay, so uh, it's a building block of some experiments I'm going to come back to later that we can use for assigning these proteins. Okay, so working out which peak belongs to which of these. Now, that looks fine, um, and it, it's very widely used. But there's another uh, family of methods which have been built around what we call rotational echo double resonance. So, redo. So again, this is a relatively this is a relatively early experiment which was um, performed. And here, what we're doing is essentially we do a, again a carbon uh, a transfer from proton to carbon, and then what we do is a spin echo. And now, during this period of time here. Uh, the rate of dephasing is proportional to the couplings to the spins around it. So typically it would be uh, the proton surrounding your carbon atom. Now, what we can do though is we can apply a train of pi pulses to uh, other low gamma nuclei. So if, for example, if we take here x as being carbon 13, now y is nitrogen 15, what we'll do is we'll do this spin echo here on our carbon 13 channel. And then what we'll do is we'll apply this train of pi pulses to a nitrogen 15. And so what this train of pi pulses is essentially doing is disrupting the averaging that you get by magic on the spinning. So if, I, if we go back to uh, one of the slides I showed you last week, what we see, for example, if you take the chemical shielding in isotropy, is that we can basically come up with these expressions for how the frequency um, process, uh, is modulated as the rotor processes. Okay? So you get these type of expressions here. Now, we can we get very, very similar expressions for things like the um, heteronuclear dipolar couplings. And so what people done is said, look, okay, if we try if we get these time dependencies, we see these type of time dependencies here. So if this is the um, how our dipolar coupling varies as a function of the rotor spinning, what we can do is basically apply a pi pulse every rotor period. What this means is that one of these terms then becomes positive. Okay? So that means over a rotor period, instead of our heteronuclear dipolar coupling getting averaged to zero, now all of a sudden we have a non zero value. If we see these terms which are modulated by two times the rotor frequency, we see that we have to apply two pi pulses per rotor period. And when you do that, you start to see the following um, uh, types of plots that you get for your heteronuclear dipolar couplings. Clearly at that point, if we start to integrate this over time, it means we now have a non-zero heteronuclear dipolar coupling. What does this mean in terms of our redo experiment? What it means is that now, not only are the protons dephasing our carbon magnetization, we also have a contribution from the couplings between the nitrogen 15 that's next to the carbon atom. Okay? And so what's going to happen? Basically, our effective T2 is going to get short. So basically, we're going to dephase this magnetization a lot faster. And so that's exactly what you see. If we go to the next slide, what we end up with is these, these so-called dephasing curves. And so what you find is that if you have a carbon atom, which is basically um, one and a half angstroms away from the nearest nitrogen atom, what you find is you have this sort of oscillatory behavior here and this rapid dephasing of your magnetization. So typically what we put here is delta S over S0. So you have your control experiment, S0, where you've basically emitted your pi pulses. And then you have your uh, delta S, which is basically the, the difference between your with and without. Okay? And so here you see that basically we'll dephase our magnetization a lot quicker if we have directly bonded carbon nitrogens than if we have things which are separated by 2.5 angstroms or 4 angstroms. And these dephasing curves are actually very, very, they're very nice to generate because we have this control experiment, this S naught all the time. It's actually very, uh, it's, a, it's a relatively nice experiment in which you can analyze this data quantitatively. Um, again, it's an experiment that's been widely used to study biomolecular systems. And here I've just got some, uh, some examples from uh, Lynn Marie Thompson's lab, where basically she's taken proteins which are involved in, uh, envi uh, the bacterial proteins involved in sensing of nutrients in the environment. And so you have, um, this type of structure of a membrane protein, the bilayer. And what people have been proposing is that um, as you get binding of a ligand to these uh, extracellular parts of the protein, what you have is a conformational change 
in these transmembrane domains here. And this is basically what's transferring the information, the ligand binding information from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. So what they've done is taken these long transmembrane domains here. They've introduced specific carbon-13 and, in this case, uh, fluorine into these uh, transmembrane domains and done carbon-13, uh, fluorine-19 redor experiments. And doing this, what you can do is basically work, look at the conformation of changes which occur upon ligand binding. So here we have a ligand-free state, here we have a ligand-bound state. And they've done the same experiments in uh, a frozen sample here. Okay? So, again, it's a very, um, it's a very effective technique. Uh, it's very, very powerful if you want to measure signal distances. So whereas getting quantitative distance information out from cross-polarization building curves is relatively challenging, using these read or defacing curves, you can start to extract single distances um, from large biomolecular assemblies with a resolution which is probably in the region of about half an angstrom, which is quite interesting if you want to do things like drug development. Now, um, so this is a nice example of how we can use Redon, and there are many others out there. We also have the, um, a tech, the downside with Redor is it doesn't transfer magnetization from one side to another. So if you wanted to use it as a building block of, as a, of a two-dimensional correlation experiment, um, it, it's not so helpful. But there's a variant of it, which is called transfer echo double resonance. And so, as you see here, what we're doing again is we're applying these trains of pipe forces. But now halfway through uh, the experiment, instead of just having an echo, what we do is apply to 90 degree forces on, uh, for example, carbon and nitrogens. When we do this, we're essentially doing an inept style transfer. So what we've done here is we've built up this heteronuclear dipolar coupling. We've then done our inept transfer, and then we've carried on building up this um, heteronuclear dipolar coupling in the second period here. And during this, during this experiment, what we've done is essentially transferred our magnetization, in this case, from our carbon atom to a nitrogen 15. You can also invert it. So now what we have is a building block of a correlation experiment here. So at this point, we've actually, ended up, we've actually we've done some form of polarization transfer. And this is a nice experiment um, if you again want to try and get these sort of nitrogen carbon correlation experiments. Why do we need both of them? Well, there's a reason that we, it's nice to have both of them. If you think back and look at the cross polarization experiments, all these experiments are working in the rotating frame. So we spin, sorry, we spin lock our, um, spin lock our magnetization. And when we spin lock our magnetization, it's sensitive to motions which are occurring on a millisecond time scale. So what we see is that the signal can be quenched very, very rapidly when we have a high density of motions on a millisecond time scale. Here, what we have is basically an experiment which is working in the laboratory frame. And so here, what the, this time period here is sensitive to motions which are occurring on the time scale, um, depending on our T1 relaxation. So it's very, very sensitive to motions which are occurring on the nanosecond time scale. So frequently what you will find is if the, your signal gets uh, annihilated completely in a cross-polarization experiment because of your T1 row relaxation, what you'll find here is that you'll actually gain some signal back because you're basically uh, beholden to different types of dynamics. So it really can be an either-or experiment. So these are the um, building blocks for doing sort of heteronuclear transfers. Um, and most of them are variants of this type of experiment. Okay. Everything okay with you so far? Makes sense, yeah. Okay. Right. So in the last few minutes, what I'm going to do is go through uh, some of the homing nuclear recovery methods. And again, there's a, there's a whole plethora of these multiple different experiments out there. Uh, and what I'm going to do is try and focus on those which I think are more interesting and sort of representative for different areas. So uh, this is just a paper taken, a uh, figure taken out of a recent book, so book chapter published. But uh, so there's a whole variety of these things. So we can have things like uh, we have we have things like proton-driven spin diffusion, dipolar-assisted rotational resonance, radio frequency-driven recoupling. Then we have things like double quantum methods such as C7, post-C7, horror, and dream. And so what I'm going to do today is focus on two examples. Uh, the first of which is rotational resonance. And the second of which is proton-driven spin diffusion stroke dark. And the, the reasons will become clear in a moment. Now, um, again, uh, the same problem we had before for the, homo for the heteronuclear couplings. If we look at the homonuclear couplings, we take our static spectrum, 
we do magic angle spinning, and what happens is all these anisotropic heat interactions here, so the dipolar coupling and the um, chemical shielding anisotropy get average. And what we're left with is basically uh, the isotropic components of our Hamiltonian, which is basically our isotropic chemical shift and our J couplings. Okay? This gave you that sensitivity and resolution. That's what we went through last week. Now, Perhaps one of the earliest examples people used of doing um, open nuclear dipolar recoupling is a technique called rotational resonance. And the reason they probably, one of the reasons it was probably discovered quite quickly is because it, it manifests itself in the spectrum quite strongly. What happens is if we take our rotor here and we spin it to the frequency which is equal to the chemical shift difference between two sites in our uh, spectrum, what we find is that we reintroduce the dipolar coupling between these two sites. Okay? Now, in the strongest case, what we have then are basically these line shapes that you see here. And these line shapes can actually be interpreted in terms of distances. Okay? So we can simulate the type of line shape we get here, and then we can extract the dipole coupling between these two sides. So in principle, if I, for example, take this carbon out group here... Is that applicable for fast dynamics, actually? For, sorry? And this line shape analysis, is it, is it, is it applicable for fast... Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. Typically, what people do is not, don't, they don't use line shape analysis. Uh, we, we, the, the reason I bring it up is because very early on, there were some examples where people have been able to use this line shape analysis to look for directly bonded carbon atoms. And the analysis is not trivial, and there are entire papers written on the subject. Um, but typically, what people do is basically what they do a polarization transfer experiment. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Yeah. So, but, yeah, as you see, what you can do is basically then step through the different pairs of spins, and you can get these different perturbations to your line shape, and you can then basically go away, fit your line shape, and extract your dipolar coupling. The downside is, is that this is an example of the perturbation you get uh, in the line shape when you have a coupling of about 800 hertz. If you, see, for example, uh, take, make the coupling a lot weaker, what you find is these perturbations to these line shapes are very, very small. And so we'll come back to how to measure those in a moment. So what's rotational resonance doing? So this is rotational resonance without maths. The way I do it, again, we have to sit there and try and create an environment whereby um, we can get exchange of magnetization without any change in energy. So if we have the same chemical shift, it's very easy for magnetization to move between the two sides because they're coupled by a many to the coupling. Okay? Now here what we have in our carbon spectrum is we have a difference in energy levels. And so what we're doing in this case though is basically setting the rotor speed uh, to this energy level difference here, and the, the rotor, uh, possession of the rotor is actually providing the energy so that we can get transferred between these two sides. So that's rotational resonance without that. Um, and so, what it enables you to do then is basically decouple these spins and either look at observation, perturbations in line shape, or rates of exchange and magnetization between. So this is, this is typically how the experiment's done. So what we do is we take our spectrum, in this case this is this molecule of acetalcholine that we mentioned earlier, and what we've done is we selectively invert one of the resonances in the spectrum, and then we set our spinning speed to the chemical shift separation between these two sides. And then when we do that, what we can do is basically measure the rate at which magnetization exchange oscillates between sites, in this case one and four. Okay? And we can do that for all the different areas. And so what you can do is basically plot out IZ minus SZ, you get these nice sort of decay curves of the here. Now if you're lucky, and the coupling's relatively strong, so here we have one where one and two, this is directly bonded, we have these relatively rapid oscillations, which we can fit with a pretty good degree of accuracy. So here we're talking fractions of an angstrom resolution. If we go to cases where the coupling's a little bit longer, what we find is that here now, we don't have these oscillation trends, so fitting these curves becomes, um, you have to do it carefully. Uh, but again, we can start to get um, distances out which have some fractions of uh, an angstrom resolution. So um, you can do these experiments. Now, until about what, 2003, 2004, what people did when they did these experiments was basically um, let, take their molecule of acetylcholine and they would label it, for example, here and here go away, purify their protein, measure the distance. Then they'd, they'd label it here and here, they'd go away, purify their protein, and the ligand, measure the distance. Clearly that's time consuming. And believe it or not, labeling is not always the most expensive part of this experiment. Sometimes you can actually preparation of the sample. 
And so some work that uh, we did, and there was also groups in uh, the US doing similar type of work at the same time, is we said, okay, well, if this rotational resonance is as band selective as we say it is, so it's so reliant on basically setting the spinning speed accurately, surely can't we use this to drive recoupling between particular spins, even in a uniform level sample? So what we did was basically we did some very, very crude simulations whereby we measured this, uh, these exchange curves as um, a function of uh, diff with different chemical shifts between them. But what we did in addition is we added, like in this case, this third evil spin to the system to see when this third evil spin would actually return our distance measurement. And lo and behold, what you find when you do these type of experiments is that as you sweep your spin to chemical shift, in the spectrum. The only time that you start to get perturbations from this third spin here is when the chemical sh shift of spin 2 here approaches either the chemical shift of spin 3 or some uh, submultiple on it. Okay? And when that happens, then the third spin becomes a problem. But we know what the chemical shifts of these resonances are. So we have an idea as to whether they've actually, whether these um, spins here may actually be perturbing. And so what we actually concluded is that we can, for, for many cases, we can do these type of rotational resonance ex uh, exchange curves for uniformly labeled samples. So we went away and we did these measurements for acetylcholine <coughs> bound to um, favorite nicotinic acetylcholine receptor again. And now what we see is we get these curves we saw before. Uh, we get these nice oscillations to them. And we can basically fit these oscillations. Um, so it's a bit of monumental effort. Each of these data points here takes between 12 and 24 hours to apply. When you do this, you can fit um, these uh, exchange curves. You can extract distances. And when you do that, what you can do is then start uh, basically refine structure. So now what we have is a whole series of distances which have a resolution which is in the region of typically sub angstrom. And we can start to refine the structure of this small acetylcholine molecule whilst it's bound to this two of protein. And so what we've done is basically done a systematic search of the conformational space. And what we end up with is basically these two symmetric families of um, structures, one here, one here. So why is this technique interesting? Well, this technique is interesting. If you think about it, this is a small molecule. Many of the drugs that the pharmaceutical companies are developing are also small molecules. Now, if you look at liquid state NMR, what people have typically done is basically meant measured lots and lots of distances with a relatively low resolution. Now, there's some issues when you're looking at small molecules. The first of which is you don't have many distances. The second of which is if it's plus or minus two angstroms, that could be the difference between this molecule being folded up entirely or totally extended. So you really do need to be able to measure these things with sub-angstrom resolution so that you can refine the structure of these um, uh, so that you can refine the structure of these small molecules when they're bound to, to the centers. So, I think in many ways it has, it has some advantages when we're studying biomolecular systems. So the advantages is the recoupling is selective, um, and we can actually carry out this analysis with a very, very um, high degree of resolution. Now the downside with these type of experiments is the fact that we have to still only one spin pair at a time. So if we go back, each of these exchange curves as I mentioned before, each point took between 12 and 24 hours to acquire. That means each exchange curve took over a week to measure. And um, so that's rather a lot with the spectrometer time. So what would be nice is if we could measure all these, all, these, um, all these distances at the same time. And that's why, because otherwise, basically, if we want to move from a small molecule to our large proteins, uh, this method is basically intractable. Yep. Um, how did you look, look at the moment with the structure? With this method? Yeah. Uh, it took me about two years. So it, it's, it's quite time consuming. Um, you have to be sure that the, the, the final results work. Um, but I mean, at the time, it's basically the only way you could really gain access to this high resolution structure estimation. Okay. The other downside is that typically when we do these measurements, we actually have to fulfill this rotational resonance condition. So that means we've actually, as I showed you earlier on, the lines get broad. The lines get broad, we have no resolution left. So if our systems get too complicated, we can't really apply. So there are limitations. 
So what people have been looking for, and this is sort of in the holy grail of solid state NMR for the last 20, 30 years, was basically coming up with methods whereby you could basically reintroduce um, these hermeneutically dipole couplings uh, in a frequency non-selective way across the entire carbon spectrum. So the analogy will be to trying to get like a nosy style experiment that you have in the liquid state to work in the solid state. So, perhaps the easiest experiment that people did, um, by far the easiest to apply, is something called proton driven spin diffusion. So, what is proton driven spin diffusion? Proton driven spin diffusion makes use of the fact that if you do the following type of experiment here, so this is almost identical to a, your, your nosy experiment, but this time we're doing it on carbons, and so we've done basically a transfer from proton to carbon. We evolve our T1, so we have our magnetization on our first carbon atom. We then store our magnetization along the longitudinal axis. We let our magnetization fold here, and then we basically read out when it's moved to the second side. Now, the problem we have is if we spin very fast, what we think is we're going to suppress a lot of the carbon-carbon interactions. So normally, naively, we wouldn't expect the carbons to talk to one another in this experiment. But what we've done here is something very, very clever. We've actually not done anything. So what we've done is we've turned off the decoupling to the protons. So at this point, we have interactions between the protons and the low gamma nuclei. So why do we care about the interactions between the protons and the low gamma nuclei? Well, we care because at this point, if we take our carbon-13, it's connected to a proton. And we already know that these protons are connected in these very, very strong networks. And this next proton may be connected to another carbon-13. Okay. So in doing so, when we turn off our decoupler here, we can get transfer of magnetization from our carbon to our proton, from our proton to another proton, and back to another carbon-13. Okay? And so in doing so, um, we can actually get very, very efficient transfer um, of magnetization between these carbon atoms. So, as I said before, as I mentioned, it's basically it's dependent on the strength of the heteronuclear coupling between the protons and the low gamma nuclei, and basically the strength of the proton-proton interactions which we classically acknowledge is basically on average by moderate magic and spinning frequencies. So when you do that, uh, what do we see? Well, this is just an example of one of the first structures which was resolved by, solved by um, solid state NMR. What we see are these nice sort of NLE-like uh, experiments. In this case, though, what we have here, we have carbon-13 versus carbon-13, and we can look at the proximity of different carbon-13 atoms with respect to one another. In the, sample, in, the, in the protein. Okay? And now we no longer measure in one distance at a time. What we're doing is measuring basically how this, for example, this carbon atom here interacts with a whole series of other carbon atoms. How do you know that the current such a result of uh, How do we know? That, yeah, um, the carbon of Well, okay, so the um, chemical shifts in the carbon 13 spectrum tend to be quite characteristic, and I'll come back to this next week. So, for example, if you take this window here between sort of 50 and 60 ppm, then usually you'd be quite confident that these are basically from the C alphas in the, in the uh, sample. So this is the, um, these ones are the protein backbone. Yeah. As you go out towards the side, out here below 50 ppm, there's some glycines which will appear about 45 here, but then as you go out here, maybe all these resonances here occur from the um, side chains. And again, then you can basically uh, start to map out which ones are interacting with each other. And you can work your way from the C alpha through to the C beta, from the C beta to the C gamma, the C gamma to C delta. And you can work your way out to the side chain. You look at the characteristic shifts, and if you look, you can look at which you can answer. Okay? We'll come back to that next week. Now, there are some disadvantages with this technique. Um, as we go to higher magnetic fields and higher magic angle spinning frequencies, what we find is that the chemical shift increases. And so as the chemical shift increases, so does the separation between these protons. So now, instead of, instead of us having this strong coupling network between protons and the sample, what we find is that this, the exchange between this doesn't occur, occur quite as readily. Okay? So that, that's the first issue. Um, the other issue is, is as we go up in magic angle spinning frequency, what we find is that we also start to average out these homonuclear frequency couplings a lot more effectively. 
So if we start to go up to 40 or 60 kilohertz, these homologues that are coming up are getting averaged by the magic number spinning as well. So at this point, one of the primary interactions that we're using for driving that transfer of magnetization between carbon atoms is now being suppressed. And at the same time, we're trying to apply this to larger and larger systems where we have more and more spectral complexity. So ideally, what we'd like to do is go to our, you know, our, our nice shiny 1.2 gigahertz magnet, say, look, OK, we have great chemical shift dispersion here. Uh, we have great sensitivity. Oh, but none of our experiments work anymore. So we have to think about ways of addressing this. So as I point, said, this causes problems. It means that we have to mix for a lot longer periods of time. Um, and this reduces the sensitivity because as we mix for longer and longer periods of time, we also get T1 relaxation kicking in. So basically, the overall sensitivity of the experiment goes down. Not really what we're looking for. So what can we do? <coughs> oh, uh, the first trick that we'll use is a technique called dipolar assisted rotary resonance, or DAR. Um, and there's also there's another acronym for it, isn't it? Rotational assisted. Bad. Um, there, there's another. There's another acronym because it was um, conceived about two groups in two groups simultaneously. Now, now again, this is a still a relatively simple experiment. What we do is again we do our proton-driven spin diffusion experiment, but now what we do is on our proton channel here we apply a weak radio frequency field, and by weak I mean that it's in the order of the spinning speed. So here we basically set uh, our RF field to either one or two times the spinning frequency. Why do we care about this? Well, if we look at the spectrum on the side here, if we look at our decoupled spectrum here of our favorite molecule, what we find is we have relatively sharp lines. Okay? Now, if we turn the decoupler on, off, before what we were hoping is these lines would broaden out so that we had some overlap uh, in the chemical shifts. Okay? If we have overlap in the chemical shifts, it means the energy levels are the same, which means we can exchange magnetization. Now, here, high spinning speed, high magnetic field, that's not happening. Now what happens when we apply this weak RF field here is that we actually actively recouple proton carbon dipole coupling. And so when we do this, what we essentially do is broaden out the different resonances. Okay? So now we have, have overlap between these different sites. And now what we start to see is we can actively recouple the spins. Okay? So we've reintroduced one of those interactions which was basically uh, suppressing the transfer of uh, magnetization. So just to give you an example, I think this is an example out of, um, this was out of Stephen Smith's lab. Again, here what we have, it's uh, background because I'm labeled properly. So here we have an example of another technique called RFDR, but then we have DAR, which I presume is this one, and proton-driven spin diffusion. So what you see is that the exchange is occurring a lot faster. Okay? Um, I should check this. But you know, then we get these type of uh, graphs that we get, these type of plots that we're seeing here, where we can basically recouple all the carbon atoms in the, in the spectrum at the same time. Okay? So, at that point, what we've done is we've gone from our broad lines that we see here, we've gained our resolution and sensitivity, and now what we've managed to do is find techniques which enable us to selectively reintroduce these anisotropic interactions at particular points in time in our pulse sequence such that we can get, start to get these nice correlation maps that we start to see here. Okay. And I think at that point, I'm going to wrap up, and then next time what we'll do is we'll make a start on protein assignment.